Okay, I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. In chapter 1, verse 1, it says that these are the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Chapter 2, verse 4, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. You may be seated. A few minutes ago, we sang the song, Take Time to Be Holy, and Lavelle mentioned that uh, he felt this song went well with the topic that preceded it. I think also this song is a good introduction to the message today. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide. And I think that's our desire. I think that's why we're here this morning, to let God be our guide while the world rushes on. Glenn just read to you the personal testimony of a man that, in many ways, was the most successful man ever to walk upon the earth. From a human perspective, in the areas of wisdom and wealth and workmanship, not to mention women, he had it all. No one equaled him. And we could say he truly was the greatest of all time. But this man had a problem. At the end of the day, there was a gnawing emptiness in the pit of his stomach. He was searching for something that would bring joy, satisfaction, fulfillment, a sense of purpose to his life. And he found that that something was elusive. He couldn't grasp it. Listen to more of his words in chapter 1 as he describes some of the things of nature and how it just seems to be an endless cycle that just repeats itself over and over again. Verse 4, he says, One generation passes away and another one comes. Someone is born, they grow up, they have children, they die. Next generation grows up, they have children, they die. The sun rises, the sun goeth down. And what does the sun do when it goes down? It just hurries back to the place where it rose yesterday and it rises again. The wind goeth toward the south and turns around towards the north. It whirleth about continually, blows one way and back the way it came from. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Onto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. It's just a cycle that goes on and on. Verse 8 talks about man. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. And he expresses his exasperation with these words Vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, Therefore, I hated life. 
says, the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. This is the desperate cry of a desperate man who realized that his earthly accomplishments got him nowhere. And to continue pursuing them was like running on a hamster wheel. But the hamster wheel was spinning full speed, and he did not know how to stop. And I think his cry, in essence, was, can somebody please stop the wheel? I went off. And he knew that the wheel was spinning too fast, and unless something changed, the results would not be very pleasant. Can somebody please stop the wheel? Well, let's fast forward to the present. Life comes at us fast and furious. We live in an unprecedented time and unprecedented opportunity. Most of us earn money like generations before never dreamed of. And if we're honest, a luxurious lifestyle is no longer a luxury. That's pretty much become the norm. And perhaps too often, if we want it, we get it. And I'm not talking just about small things. We can travel all over the world without batting an eye. And we're busy. We can work 50, 60 hours or more a week and still have a plethora of activities to fill our evenings and our weekends. And sooner or later, we may come to the realization that activity does not always equal productivity. This little hamster we looked at, he was very active. He was running and running. How far was he getting? Nowhere. His activity did not equal productivity. And we may also realize that productivity does not equal fulfillment and joy and meaning. And in the midst of our life full of hamster wheels, where do we find the purpose? Solomon came to the end of his life, and he looked back. And he had questions about his life. And that causes me to think, when I come to the end of my life, and I look back, what will my perspective be? How will I evaluate my life? Will I be able to say, like Paul, I have finished my course. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Or will I, like the writer of Ecclesiastes say, behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. I invite you to turn to Psalm 90 which is actually our text for today, for today. Ecclesiastes was just an introduction. And the subtitle of the message is Finding Purpose in Life. Psalm 90, as far as we know, is the only psalm that was written by Moses. We don't know for sure, but it's very possible that Moses wrote this psalm near the end of the 40 years of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And it would have been easy for him to say at this time, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And think about what happened during those 40 years. We surmise, okay, we know that everyone over the age of 20 that left Egypt died in the wilderness, and we can estimate that that was probably well over 1 million people, 1.2 million people, some people surmise. If there were 1.2 million people that died in those 40 years, that comes down to over 80 people every day. Talk about a lot of funerals. Could have given a sense of futility. Here we go around the wheel one more time. Bury 80 more people. Get up tomorrow, bury 80 more people. Get up the next day, bury 80 more people. Futility. Was that Moses' perspective? 
Well, let's look at finding purpose in life, and I'd like to look at some observations from Psalm 90 in finding purpose in life and how we, in the middle of our busy lifestyles, in the middle of all of our activities, and yes, in the middle of our goals and desires here on earth, in the middle of all of that, how can we find purpose? Is there meaning? Is it purposeful? First of all, we need to look to God. We see that in verses 1 and 2. Now, we all have a concept of God. Every one of us here has a concept of God. It may be true or it may be false. For most of us, probably for all of us, it's somewhere in between there. We don't grasp all of the truth of who God is, but we grasp some of it. We never, never entirely grasp it, but that should be our, our goal. And the more we look to God, the more we learn about God, and even more, the, the more we learn of God himself, to know him. So let us look to God. The first thing I see in these verses in verse 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. God encompasses our location. He is our dwelling place place. He is where we dwell. Now, most of you, if someone would ask you where you live, you might say, I'm from Pennsylvania, or I'm from Virginia, or I'm from some other state, wherever it may be. Some of you, depending on who asks you, you know they're looking for something more specific. You might say, well, I'm from Lancaster County. Or you might say, I'm from Burdenhand, or Gordonville, or Narvon, or wherever it may be. How many of you ever told somebody, when they ask you where you live, how many of you ever said, well, I live in God? It's not a common response. And if you said that to somebody, well, they might say, well, that doesn't tell me anything. God is everywhere. But the other way of looking at it is that tells us a lot. If you say, I live in God, that tells a lot about your life, because that will affect everything you do if you truly live in God. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on where we live. We like certain localities better than others. We like a certain kind of house. We like a certain kind of neighborhood. We put a lot of emphasis onto that. But the thing that really matters is, do we live in God? And it's helpful to recognize that. What a blessed habitation that is. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. So Moses is recognizing as he looks at God that God encompasses our location, where we live. And if we recognize that, that's going to make a big difference in how we live. As we recognize that there's not a single aspect of our life that is not surrounded by God. And if we acknowledge his presence every moment of our lives, it's going to affect what we value. And when we value what he values, that will give us purpose. We're looking at finding purpose in life. We need to look to God who encompasses our location. Number two, he also encompasses our lifespan. In verse two, before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even, the ever, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. These two verses encompass Time and space. Verse 2 is time. Verse 1 is space. God is there. God encompasses our, life our lifespan, but not only that, so much more. All of eternity, from everlasting to everlasting. So when we think about what really matters in time, let's think back, think back to Solomon. And all he accomplished, his gardens, his orchards, his pools that he made, all of his gold, his reflections, what difference does that make in your life today? Do you benefit anything from that? Did it make any difference for eternity? Now, perhaps some of the wisdom that he expressed did, but I'm talking about his, his possessions here. Or let's consider the Apostle Paul. Did his accomplishments make any difference to you? When you consider that Paul carried the gospel to Europe 
from whence our ancestors come. The ministry of Paul may have made a tremendous difference in our lives. We're looking at the eternal perspective. God encompasses our lifespan, and when God looks at our lifespan, he does not look at a mere 70 or 80 years. He looks at our life, at our lives, in the perspective, in the context of eternity, and what difference our lives can make for eternity. And there are many examples we can look at whose lives definitely made an impact on eternity. God sees the big picture. When in our imagination we step off the vanishing point of time, God is there, and his presence has purpose and meaning. You see, my vision is so limited. I, I'm so nearsighted. I can't see next year. I can't even see three months from now what's going to happen. We make our plans. Our plans are limited to what we know. And maybe our plans take into perspective 10 or 20 or maybe even 50 years. But God sees the big picture. Brothers and sisters and young people, if you want your lives to count, if you want a sense of purpose, we have to look beyond the immediate time frame of today. Look to God to find purpose. Look to God. Number two, as we look at Moses' testimony here, look to God. Number two, inspect your past and your present. Look back. Look at your present. Evaluate my life in the light of God's perspective as we look back at our past and our present. And we see several observations that Moses made here. First of all, he says, my days are so illusionary. Now, I'm using my own words here for some of this. We know what an illusion is. It's something that appears to be one thing, but it, it really isn't. Sometimes we, we look at optical illusions that kind of confuse us, baffle us. And Moses uses the example of, of nighttime here. I'll read verses 3 to 6. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning, it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening, it is cut down and withereth. So Moses uses the example of a watch in the night. And we know how much of an illusion night can bring. For children, it may be things that go bump in the night. They're alone. They hear this noise. They can't identify it. And they're just certain there's this monster in the closet that's ready to jump out and get them. In the morning, their fear is gone. It was an illusion. They know there's nothing in the closet. Now, does that affect only children? Sometimes we as adults lie awake at night and our minds are spinning. We face fears and our emotions get the best of us. But in the morning, it just kind of all fades into the background. Or what about our nighttime dreams? They're so real. They're so vivid. I had a dream last night. I was frustrated. I was driving a stick shift car, and I was trying to start on a hill, and I, I just couldn't manage it. I just couldn't go. And there was these other drivers around me and looking at me, and I was frustrated. Am I frustrated now? No, it was nothing to it. I can drive a car. It's nothing. And that's how our dreams are. You're so sure in the moment that it's reality. It's so real. But you wake up, and it's nothing. You've probably had the experience where you wake up from a, a pleasant dream, and, and you just want to re-immerse yourself in that dream. You want that dream to continue. You want to complete it, and you, you try to hear it, and you try to see it, but you can't. It's gone. And if we want to find purpose for our life, 
if we try to find purpose for our life in the things of this world, the day is coming when we will wake up and realize that it was only a dream. Those things that seem so real and occupied so much of our time will just simply vanish into thin air. They're nothing. Those goals that seemed almost within grasp, we were almost about to lay our hands upon them. They vanished. They don't exist. Those obsessions that drove my life, those victories that I wished for more than anything else, they evaporated and there's nothing left to grasp. If we try to find fulfillment in the temporary things of life, the day is coming when we will wake up and all that is left will be the disappointment of what you thought you had and don't. What you were so, so sure was there is gone forever. So as we try to find purpose in life, Moses says we need to inspect our life. Are we pursuing illusions of the night? Are you chasing an illusion? So Moses' testimony, my days are so illusionary, and he goes on, my failures are so great. In verses 7 and 8, for we are consumed by thine anger and by thy, by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Now Moses certainly had a lot to reflect on on his life as he spent those days in the wilderness. And I think sometimes probably his failures loomed large in his eyes. You know, he talks about his iniquities, his secret sins. You know, the day he killed that Egyptian, he thought no one else knew. I can do this it's not going to make a difference. But even his secret sins were set in the light before God. And that decision he made that day when he met the Egyptian back there in Egypt, many years prior, at this point, it was decades ago. And yet that decision changed the course of his life. And some of us may find ourselves there as well. We made decisions that have affected the course of our lives. And they haunt us. And then there was that moment when the miserable whining and complaining and grumbling of those around him just got to him. And in anger, he ignored the direction of God and took his rod and smote that rock in anger. I think that came back to haunt Moses. Perhaps you are in a position where you are wishing that you could rewrite your history. We can't do that. We can't go back and change the past. Moses recognized that. I, I can't change my past. The, these sins, my, my failures, they're great. But in spite of that, our future can be filled with purpose. And like Moses, we need to simply acknowledge where we've been. He acknowledged his failures. We try to ignore our failures. We don't want to talk about them. We want to sweep them under carpet. It's in the past. We'll ignore it. But God knows. It tells us in these verses that they are in the light of thy countenance. God's countenance just shines a light on our lives that exposes every single aspect. And like Moses, we need to acknowledge those sins and allow that loving light of God to expose them so that we can acknowledge them because it's only when we acknowledge them that we will be able to really move forward. Moses says, my nights are filled with illusions. My days are so illusionary. My failures are so great. And my time is so short and empty. Verse 9, for all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, or maybe even fivescore, for a few of us, 
that reach that or getting close to it. Yet is their strength, labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. We might live to be 70 or 80 or 100. But our days, we put our strength into our labor and our toil. And this says we spend our years as a tale that is told. At the end of our life, what will your story be? What will your tale be that you have to tell? That depends largely on what your ambitions are currently. So what are your ambitions? Recently, I read a survey. There, were some, there was a, a question asked to some high school students about what they would choose if they could have anything they wished for. Probably some of you have read that. Five or four out of five students wished for money. And I'm talking about, or they were talking about money measured in millions. So I asked, is that the measure of success? Is money the measure of success? Is life only a monopoly game? And he who dies with the most wins? Is that the measure of success? Now, back to that survey, I want to be fair. There was only one senior who was included in that survey, and the senior said they wish for wisdom. So I think there's hope that as people mature, their values mature with them. And also, to be fair, uh, no one said what they want to use their money for, so I think we can assume that they wanted money that, so that they could support missions and help refugees and maybe fund Bible translations. So um, I, I applaud those ambitions that these people had. But my point is, life is short. And what do you want to be remembered for? What tale will you have to tell? I'm reminded of Glenn's sermon two weeks ago. You have one opportunity at life. No pressure, but you've got to make it. You've got to make it count. So let us inspect our lives to see if what we are living for is really what we want to be remembered for at the end of our life. So we need to look to God to find purpose. We need to inspect our past and our present. But Moses doesn't stop there. He has an eye for the future. Focus on new priorities for your future. And Moses gives us some priorities in this passage that we can focus on. And if we make these priorities our priorities, I think we can have a future that is filled with purpose. He says, teach us in verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts onto wisdom. Teach us to count our days. We need to be aware that there is an end. You know, many people live this life as if it just goes on indefinitely. And this life is going to continue going on and on and on, just like that wheel that goes around and around and around. We need to be aware that there is an end. That is why you have a fuel gauge on your car, because there's an end to that supply of fuel. That is why when you play basketball, there's a clock running, because you know there's an end, and you keep that eye on the clock because you know the time is coming when you only have a half a second to make that buzzer beater. The end is coming. We need to keep our eye on the end. Teach us to count our days. If we're not aware of that, the results can be devastating. I, I read a story recently about a man by the name of Carl McCunn. Carl McCunn lived in Alaska. And he had two passions in his life. His one passion was photography, and his other passion was wildlife and nature. And he combined those two passions into one, photographing nature and wildlife. 
And in 1981, Carl planned an extensive photography, photography trip into northern Alaska. And this was far removed, hundreds of miles from any civilization. And he made plans to be taken by a bush plane, a float plane, dropped off in this remote, unnamed lake in springtime, and he was going to spend the summer there. Now, he made a lot of preparations for this trip. He packed 500 rolls of film. Back when you had rolls of film, he wanted to be prepared. He had 1,400 pounds of provisions. He had a rifle. He had a shotgun. And he was flown into northern Alaska and dropped off. And he enjoyed his summer. He recorded his summer. With the pictures he took, he kept a journal. And things were going well for a while. But as summer progressed, drew towards an end, Carl began to develop this feeling of uneasiness within him. And he wrote in his journal one day some of the saddest words you can imagine in his setting and in ours. He wrote, I think I should have used more foresight in arranging for my departure. He was hundreds of miles from any civilization, had no method of communication. And at that point, it was too late. Now, why do I say there are such sad words? Can you imagine coming to the autumn time of your life and saying, I wish I would have made better arrangements for my departure? Can you imagine getting to the point where it's too late? Well, it wasn't that Carl had given no thought to his departure. He had actually talked to several different pilots about his departure. And that was part of the problem. Because each one of those pilots thought the other one was going to go and pick him up. And no one figured that they were counting on him. So part of his problem was that he did not have a single concentrated purpose. His idea going into this was, well, there are multiple options. And surely one of them will work out. But he did not have that singular option. And if that's our approach to life, well, there's lots of options. Something will work out. We will be in for disaster. And there was another problem with Carl. He had gone on a similar excursion to this several years before. He spent the summer in another location. And he did not return home when he was expected. So his dad called the police and asked them to search for him. Well, as it turned out, everything was fine. He was doing well, and he was planning to come home in a few days. And Carl said to his dad, please don't ever do that again. I don't need that. So his dad didn't. So Carl waited. Sometimes we are in that situation where we tell people, you know, I, I really wish you'd stop meddling in my life. I, I wish you'd just leave me alone. And perhaps that person will choose to do so. Carl waited. And his story is recorded in his journal. One day he wrote, it's certainly my own fault that I'm here now. He knew he was not prepared to face the winter. And to jump to the end of the story, the following year, his body was found in his tent. He did not survive the winter. We need to count our days. The end is coming. Will we be prepared or will we have regrets? And I think there's another meaning to this. Teach us to count our days. And you've heard this expression before. Teach us to make our days count. So as we look ahead at the end, what are we doing with our time until then? We need to make our days count. Obviously, we don't know how many days we have left. Today may be my last day. If I knew I had just one year left to live, 
I would probably make a list of things that I consider high priority, top priority, things that I want to do. Well, why don't I do them? If I am one of the stronger ones that Moses refers to here, that lived to be 80 years old, nearly 75% of my life has already passed. Only 25% remaining. What am I going to do with those days? Am I satisfied with the trend of my accomplishments? Am I making my days count? I read the story of another man who is somewhat in contrast to Carl. This man's name was John Beekman, and this was also years ago. He was told by his doctor that his days were numbered because of his physical health. He had a serious heart condition, and the doctors considered his condition pretty much unsurvivable. And he said, your only hope is a risky procedure. And up until that point, only two people had survived that procedure. He said, if you survive, you will be survivor number three. And there was actually a film on his life with that title, Survivor Number Three. Well, the surgery was completed. John survived the surgery, and he now had a choice. My health is at risk. Shall I slow down my pace and hoard my days? Or shall I make my days count? I don't know how many I have. Should I make them count? He chose the latter. And ignoring his doctor's warnings, John and his wife Elaine headed to the jungles of southern Mexico, not to retire in the southern climate. He kept one eye on the zero hour announced by his doctors, while he kept the other eye on eternity and the lost souls around him. And he invested the days that he had left, living in primitive conditions. He taught the people in that community to read. He translated the Bible for them. And he saw a church emerge in that community where before there had been only paganism and despair. I think John knew what it meant to make his days count. And I doubt that at the end of his life, that he said, vanity of vanities, always vanity. He made his days count. Moses continued his prayer with the words that we may apply our hearts onto wisdom. Lord, give us wisdom to make our days count. So the first priority as we face our future is that God would teach us. Our second priority is forgive us. Now, I mentioned earlier some of the failures that Moses may have been referring to in his life, in his passage. And now in verse 13, he says, Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. Now, he doesn't actually use the words forgive us, but I think that is the idea here. God will... Can, can, his request was that it would repent God or that God would change his perspective. And I think this was the idea of God, I, I confess my sins and I'm, I'm begging for your mercy. I, I know I've sinned, but Lord, I need your mercy. He was acknowledging before God. And what we're doing here, we're considering point two was looking at the past Point three is establishing new priorities for the future. And if we want to have purpose for the future, we need to confess the sins of the past. Recognize them, beg for God's mercy, and move on. I think this prayer for forgiveness also includes the cry. I think what, what Moses' cry was, God, remake me, rebuild me. I know I've failed but I want you to, to leave that behind. Can you rebuild my life? His cry may have been that of David in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So the second priority for a life of purpose is to seek God's forgiveness for our past so that we can move forward in a new way. And his third priority our third priority, verse 14, O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Satisfy us. 
Now, I want to point out that these three priorities that Moses expressed, teach us, forgive us, satisfy us, they are actually three prayers. And these prayers, obviously, are prayed to God. So with that in mind, instead of just saying, teach us, forgive us, satisfy us, what these priorities really are is, God, you teach us, God, you forgive us, and God, you satisfy us. There's so many places I can look for satisfaction. But God is our source of satisfaction. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. God is the one who brings satisfaction. Psalm 107, For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. You know, everyone in this world seeks satisfaction. We all seek satisfaction. But there is only one source where we'll find it. Now, money serves a purpose. We can't live without it. We all have it. Probably most of us have some of it with us right here at this moment. It serves a purpose. Does it satisfy? No. We seek promotions. We have goals. We seek relationships. We seek accomplishments and victories. They have their place. They serve a purpose in life. But do they bring satisfaction? No. Our satisfaction is in God. And furthermore, he says, satisfy us early with thy mercy. Don't wait until you're old to try to find satisfaction in God. Seek it early. Seek it now. Today is the day. Do what is necessary to find purpose. Ask God to teach us, forgive us, and satisfy us. And don't just pray, God, satisfy me. Pray, God, you satisfy me. That's where it's all at. Where it's all at. Let's move at the fourth aspect of finding purpose in life. And we're doing these three things. It's then that we can experience purpose, and fulfillment. There's an interesting sequence that is repeated frequently in the book of Psalms. And that sequence is, there's an expression of trouble, there's an expression of trust, and there's an expression of triumph. And if, if you keep that in mind, you will see that repeatedly in the Psalms. For example, in the, in the Songs of Degrees, Sometimes you see this repeated or this sequence in consecutive psalms. One psalm will be a, a psalm that expresses trouble. The following psalm will express trust. And then the third psalm will express triumph. In some psalms, we see all three in the same psalm. And I think that's what we see here. I mentioned uh, verses 7 to 11 where, where Moses talked about his past, the trouble he was in. And then his prayers where he expresses his trust, God, you teach me, you forgive me, you satisfy me, his trust in God. And that leads us to the triumph, which we see in verses 15 to 17. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. I think what Moses is saying here is there was a day when I followed my own path and it didn't work. All it yielded was trouble. And he had the results of those trouble. He recognized the futility. So then he focused on new priorities. He put his trust in God. And now he's saying, Lord, I see the triumph. When my life is in your hands, I see the glory. And I see the beauty. He's saying, establish us. Verse 17 Moses may be saying, I tried hard to establish my life, but I gave up. 
I can't do it. It's beyond me. Lord, I want you to establish my life. I want you to give me purpose. I find joy and purpose in allowing you to establish the work of my hands. I'd like to think of the emphasis here in verse 17, not only on the beauty and the establishment, but on Moses' focus on allowing God to bring these things. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, not the beauty of my accomplishments. Establish thou the work of my hands. Psalm 16 says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 36, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. Purpose and fulfillment in life is found in doing God's will and experiencing God's favor. In conclusion, I'd like to look back over these four points once again. Look to God, inspect your past up to your present, focus on new priorities and experience purpose and fulfillment. Do you notice any sequence and result in these four points? If this is our purpose, I think we can experience the life that God has for us. If we honestly and sincerely follow him, then God will bless us with life a life of purpose, and a life that will allow us, with Paul, at the end, to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Let's kneel for prayer. Lord, I thank you this morning for this testimony in Psalm 90, for the testimony of Moses. And we recognize there were failures in his life. And Lord, this morning, we recognize the failures.